Okay, <clears throat> we're back. Jonah's been hanging out in the fish for three days and three nights while you all have been going about your whatever you did all day today and yesterday. Okay, so Jonah disobeyed and Jonah got thrown overboard and God prepared a special fish. Now, I didn't point this out yesterday. Remember I told you yesterday that it was actually a good thing that Jonah was swallowed by a fish? What would have happened if the fish hadn't shown up to swallow him? He would have been dead. He would have drowned. So most people think of this as a punishment, and it was definitely a attention getter, but it was also God's way of saving Jonah. God let the, actually made this fish especially for Jonah to swallow him up, to hold on to him for a three-day timeout to make him get his head straight and make him turn back to God. So a lot of times people think of this as some sort of punishment, which it sort of is, but at the same time, God created a lifeboat here, a, a raft like you get at a, a water park <laughs> to hold on to him for a while until he finally got his head right and his heart right. So when Jonah was over, thrown overboard into the raging sea, Jonah had no hope of staying alive. He thought he was dead. The billow, billowing waves would soon drown him, he thought. But just then, a great fish came swimming toward Jonah. Oh, hadn't thought of that, hadn't expected that, and opened his mouth. Jonah felt himself entering the mouth of this great sea monster and sliding down its slimy throat into its stomach. Jonah felt around and realized he was still alive inside the fish's belly. Now, I want you to think for a second. Most of you have probably thrown up before. Or... You've been around someone that throws up before. What does it smell like? Nasty, right? Really stinks. Well, technically what's coming up is just what's sitting in your stomach. It's not like because you threw it up, it smells that way. That is actually what, if you were to go down into your stomach right now, you would smell. That's what it smells like. Because stomach acid and juices that are in your stomach that God has created to help break down the food and make it usable for you for nutrition, it just smells bad. It smells like that. So that's what Jonah's smelling here. And by the way, he didn't have his phone that he could pull out for a night light or, or a, uh, I can't think of course, what do you call it? Flashlight. For a flashlight, it was complete total darkness. It's not like they have windows, right? In a fish's belly. <laughs> so he couldn't see even the hand in front of his face. And, but he could smell and it did not smell good. So, okay, here he is. Well, I'm still alive. I've survived this. I didn't drown and the fish didn't eat me per se. I'm still alive. He thought though he would now surely die in the belly of the great whale that swallowed him alive. But after a while, he realized he was very much still alive in the fish's belly. If you found yourself suddenly in a fish's stomach, what would you do? Never thought about that, have you? Think about it for a second. You'd probably do exactly what Jonah did. You'd start praying. I would start praying. The wise thing to do in trouble is always the first thing we should do is to pray. Remember, we talked about this before. I hate it when people say, oh, all we can do now is pray. No, that's the best thing you can do. The first thing you should do, we need to pray right now. Ask God to help us. That should not be your last resort. That should be your first resort. No one but God could help Jonah, right? How could Jonah stay alive in such this such a horrible place? He stayed alive because God prepared this particular fish for him, and it was God who kept Jonah alive three days and three nights in the fish's belly. Our God is a God of miracles. Though Jonah had tried to forget God, he now prayed a sincere prayer to God, and he was willing to do whatever God wanted him to do, wouldn't you? He promised God that if he would get him out of this terrible place, that he would keep his vows and preach God's message to the people of Nineveh. Jonah was finally willing to obey God. He admitted he was wrong in refusing to go to Nineveh and trying to run from God. He promised God that if he would get him out of the fish's belly, he would give sacrifices of thanksgiving to God. Jonah was now very willing to go to Nineveh and preach God's message. 
The three days and three nights in the fish's stomach gave him plenty of time to think and to pray, and he had time to be sorry for his sin. When we disobey God, we are really telling God that we know better than he does. How foolish we are to think that. Are we wiser than our creator God? Of course not. Isn't it wonderful though that God will forgive us if we ask him? Even when we have willfully done wrong, but it's much better not to do wrong in the first place. The Bible tells us that the way of transgressors, that means sinners, people who break the law, break God's law is hard. The way of transgressors is hard. It would have been much easier if he just obeyed in the first place and God would have taken care of him. Jonah found out how hard life could be in the belly of a fish. The way of obedience is the only happy way. Think about this. What could you eat? There's nothing to eat except what the fish is eating. And I don't think you could even drink anything. Ugh. Well, God, of course, heard Jonah's prayer. And he forgave his son and delivered him from the slimy prison. On day number three, God made that fish have a tummy ache. And he delivered him from the slimy prison. Blech. The fish vomited him up on dry land. The fish swam, swam back into the sea. And I'm sure it was probably glad to get rid of that thing in his stomach that was causing him to have a bellyache. And Jonah was thrilled to realize he was still alive, although fish vomit. This, no doubt, left him very weak, though. After three days and nights in the fish's belly, not being able to move around, not being able to eat or drink, Jonah got up. He washed himself off, and the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, told him again, please go to Nineveh and preach God's message. God gave Jonah another chance to obey. Jonah had learned his lesson. This time he obeyed and went as quickly as he could to Nineveh. Isn't it wonderful that God does not cast us aside when we fail him? He's always ready to forgive us and take us back into his love and give us a second chance. Jonah finally arrived at the great and wicked city of Nineveh that was so large it took him three days to walk across the city. If we were to start at the north end of Wichita and walk all the way to the south end of Wichita, do you think it would take three days? I don't think it would. Our city is not that big. I mean, I'd have to put it in Google. There you go. Put it in Google and when instead of driving directions, Look at the walking time. I bet you could walk across Wichita in a shorter amount of time than three days. Well, it took Jonah three days to walk across. Jonah preached God's message all the way to anybody that he saw. He said, yet 40 days and none of us shall be overthrown. It was a short message, but very direct. As he walked through the city, he kept repeating those same words over and over. 40 days and Jonah will be destroyed. Or Jonah, huh, sorry, Nineveh. 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. Turn to God, 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. To his surprise, the Ninevites didn't come at him angrily, put him in jail, beat him up, kill him. They actually listened to God's message. They were not angry at him at all. They listened intently to Jonah's frightening words. And that message really got their attention. They thought, if this prophet has come all the way from Israel to warn us, we better listen. And they listened, they did, and they believed God. The people so much believed what Jonah said that they fasted or stopped eating and put on scratchy sackcloth. Remember we talked about this when people are very serious or mourning or want to show God how serious they are. They stop eating and they put the ashes on them and the sackcloth. To show, they did that to show Jonas God that they believed his words and were turning from their sins. The king of Nineveh, when he heard Jonah's words, immediately left his throne, took off his royal robe, dressed himself in sackcloth, and sat down in a pile of ashes. The king went further. He made a proclamation that every person in Nineveh should fast, not eat food or drink, water, and put on sackcloth. It's a lot like what our country is doing now, sort of. The governor's and the president and the doctors that are working on the coronavirus are all told us to stay at home, to try to stay away from getting the, the illness and to keep it contained. And Americans have obeyed. And if they hadn't, it might've been a lot worse. 
this is similar to what happened here in Nineveh. The Ninevites didn't have to listen to Joseph, Joseph, Jonah. They could have killed him. They could have put him in jail. The king could have ordered him to be killed, but they didn't. They listened and they said, we need to obey. We need to listen to this. God knew. God wasn't surprised. Jonah was surprised. God was, wasn't surprised. He's not willing that anybody should go to hell, that anybody should perish. He wants everybody to be saved and go to heaven. And he knew these Ninevites, and he knew that if he sent a messenger, they would listen. God knew. <clears throat> so everyone quickly turned from their evil ways. And the king urged his people to turn away from their evil and their violence and to cry out mightily to God. He told the people if they would do that, then God might spare their city and they wouldn't perish. From Jonah's message, the people of Nineveh knew that the true God was angry with him, with them and would destroy them if they did not repent. They were sorry for their sins and turned from their evil deeds. God saw that and forgave them. The 40 days went by and God did not have to destroy the city of Nineveh. God forgave them just like he forgives all who are sorry for their sins and turn to him. He will forgive anyone who repents, even the worst of sinners. No matter how bad they've been, God forgives. What a wonderful God we have. So, don't you think Jonah should have been excited and happy to see this? He didn't get killed. The people listened. The people turned to God. He's kind of a, he's a prophet, so he's kind of a preacher. If the preach, if you were been in church before and someone has come to Jesus and asked him to be um, their savior, the pastor and everyone in the church are so happy and they rejoice. And the Bible says angels make a big celebration. They party in heaven every time someone is saved. So Jonah should have been in on that, right? Jonah, Jonah, Jonah. He should have been pleased that the Ninevites believed his message and turned to God. And therefore their city was not going to be destroyed at the end of 40 days. But Jonah was not happy. He was very disappointed and displeased. He went outside the city of Nineveh, built himself a little booth or shelter out of dried branches. Sitting in his little booth on the east side of the city of Nineveh, Jonah watched and waited, probably hoping that God would still change his mind and destroy Nineveh. And he sulked. He pouted. Is that, you think, what a preacher would do at a church service and people become saved, come up, to repent, and be saved? You think the preacher would sit down and pout? That's what this guy did. He was disappointed, even angry, that God didn't destroy Nineveh at the end of the 40 days. Nineveh was a bad place. God, you should be destroying them. Why are you giving them forgiveness? They don't deserve it. That's not for Jonah to say, is it? Jonah was a sinner just like them. Maybe he wasn't as evil as the people in Nineveh, but he was a sinner too. Jonah wanted these people to be punished, not be forgiven. He said to God, I knew you'd do this because you're merciful and kind God. <laughs> He said that as, as, as if it were an accusation or a bad thing. It's a good thing that God is merciful and kind. That's why I fled to Tarshish. That's why I left. I didn't want to come here. I knew you'd do this. Jonah's heart was like, was not like God's heart. He did not love the people of Nineveh. Jonah, angry that God was such a merciful, kind God, wanted to die. <clears throat> Sitting there pouting. In the fish's stomach, he had thanked God for saving his life. But now he thought he would have been better off dead. The Lord spoke to Jonah. Do you do well to be angry? In other words, Jonah, do you have a good reason to be angry? Jonah didn't have a good reason to be angry, but he was angry anyway. He wanted God to destroy the Ninevites. But God had forgiven them instead. So Jonah obeyed God in preaching to the Ninevites. He did his part. He did what God said. He certainly didn't have God's love in his heart. Jonah sat there and pouted. When we pout, we're angry because we cannot have our own way. As Jonah sat under the booth pouting, God prepared a gourd vine to grow up to provide shade for his pouting prophet. He was sitting there in the heat, and this gourd had great big, huge leaves, see? And by the way, does a plant usually grow that big overnight? No, another miracle that God did. As God had prepared a great fish, God now was preparing a gourd vine. God does big things and little things. The gourd plant grew quickly overnight. The next day it was big enough to shade, provide shade for Jonah. 
Oh, Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gourd vine and delighted in the cool shade that, got, that the plant gave him from the hot blistering sun while he was pouting. But Jonah needed to learn some more lessons, still hasn't learned them. So God prepared a worm and the next morning, the worm ate through the stalk of the plant, which caused the gourd to wither. Jonah saw that the worm, worm had killed the gourd plant. He felt sorry for the gourd vine that gave him the cool shade and the comfort he enjoyed and also protected him from the hot sun. Jonah was angry that the gourd vine had withered and died and that he had no more shade. God then prepared a strong, hot east wind to blow on Jonah, make it even hotter. With his shade gone and the scorching hot wind blowing along with the sun, Jonah became so miserable and angry that he wanted to die. God asked Jonah again, do you do well to be angry? Jonah answered, I do well to be angry even unto death. God said to Jonah, you took pity on the gourd that you didn't even plant or water. You felt bad when the gourd died. Should I not take pity on the great city of Nineveh where there were more than 120,000 people that cannot tell their right hand from their left hand and also many cattle? God wanted to teach Jonah that God's love is so great that he loves everyone in the world and wants all people, even the most wicked people of, of every language, color, and nation, even the people in ISIS, if they turn from their wicked ways, ask for forgiveness, God wants to forgive them too. He wants all of them to come to know him and receive his forgiveness. God was glad that the people of Nineveh repented so that he did not have to destroy them, especially the children whom he loves very much. God wanted Jonah to learn about his love and mercy for all the people of the world. Aren't we glad that God loves all people and will show mercy on all who turn to him? When Jesus came to earth and lived many years after Jonah, he spoke about the prophet Jonah and said, he referenced this story, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. We just came from Easter. Jesus spent three days and three nights in the tomb. Jesus was referring to his dying on the cross and his being in the grave three days and three nights before he rose from the dead. It's because of Jesus' love that he died for our sins. He arose three days later so that we can be forgiven and go to heaven when we die. The story of Jonah teaches us that God has great love for all people, even the most wicked people. Jesus' death on Calvary's cross and his resurrection three days later are the big proof that God loves all people and desires all people to come to him for forgiveness and to be saved. Now, sadly, we that's the way this, the story ends in the book of Jonah. If you want to read it, it's a very short book. I think it only has four chapters. It's a short story, and this is how it ends. Jonah's sitting here. Do you think he's still sitting there? <laughs> we don't know what happened to Jonah afterwards. I hope he turned again like he did when the fish swallowed him. I hope he turned again back to God and asked God to forgive him for this. This is, this is terrible, terrible thing for any person to feel. So sadly, we don't know. We don't know if he turned and went back to being a prophet, being a preacher and obeying God after this. Or if this time he never turned back to God, we don't know. And all we have now is this lesson for us that God gives everyone a second chance. God wants everyone to repent and to come to him. And if he gives that much uh, deliverance and forgiveness to those people that were so bad in Nineveh, and even to this guy here, God still loves Jonah. God still wants him to change. We'll have to wait till we get to heaven someday and ask, see if Jonah uh, turned back to God or not. We'll find out then. In the meantime, though, I hope you learned some new stuff from Jonah. And I hope you learned that everyone can be forgiven and God is not willing that anyone should be perished. He's waiting until the very last person is going to be saved before he'll return because he wants everyone that will go to heaven. All you have to do is choose the Lord. See you tomorrow. <laughs>